my uh, topic here is as you can see catalysis and chemistry so i'm going to be talking about a bit about catalysis now uh, i am not a catalyst uh, catalysis expert but it has been a fascination for me uh, so on a personal level i try to find out what is catalysis how is it important and of course as i started practicing uh, uh, as a chemical engineer so i had to really work with a lot of catalysts and so my journey and uh, the journey of catalysis is what is uh, going to be told here uh, i don't know uh, how many of us are aware what is the origin of the word catalysis per se it uh, comes from uh, very old greek words kata which is very common which means going down lower in energy or anything and luin luin means to loosen up things so essentially it meant to dissolve in old greek it meant to dissolve kata luin was the word which would mean to dissolve something so from that it has really uh, transformed into catalysis which we'll be defining uh, shortly and everybody knows about it but the transformation was the problems that were being faced by greeks or ancient civilizations at that time was maybe they wanted to find something which would dissolve everything so one magical uh, liquid which will you know help them dissolve everything like something like aqua regia or something and to the current state of affair where we want to accelerate things where we want to do reactions more efficiently so, or we want to do physical changes more efficiently so so this is a classical definition in all uh, dictionaries you will get this is a catalyst is a substance that changes rate of chemical reaction blah 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 so this is a typical graphical presentation of uh, where uh, uh, you have reactants and uh, then you have an energy hump so that's the barrier energy and then uh, you start having a chemical reaction and you get the products and with catalyst that barrier comes down and therefore you are able to do reaction you are able to initiate sustain and maintain reactions much faster here the time is shown same but it could be also that you are accelerating the rate of reaction also and uh, therefore you uh, do it in a much shorter time in uh, this uh, catalyst in uh, chemistry this started sometimes in early 19th century and uh, the peak of if you look at the usage of this word or how people were using this word so there are people who do research, do research on these kind of things so somewhere around uh, middle of 20th century it really peaked and after that has been there has been a small dip but it is now in continuous focus so that means from uh, middle of the last century onwards there has been a very large amount of focus on catalysis when i say large relative to the previous uh, millennia so uh, the current capital uh, market is around uh, 35 billion us dollars which uh, and it's expected in uh, next 4 uh, 5 years it will be around uh, 48 billion dollars major segments are petroleum refining petrochemicals and chemicals polymerization and environmental and environmental as most of you would be aware would be something like uh, catalytic converters uh, which are fitted in automobiles these days so that's a major plus of course you have like nox abatement and uh, various uh, Uh, point of discharge abatements uh, technologies available which are based on catalysts so this is uh, the uh, kind of products where uh, catalysts are used in a major way uh, in the current uh, situation so uh, if you see ethylene propylene butylene so these are all uh, steam cracking and other uh, high temperature and high process that don't involve catalyst to some extent and 
uh, whereas uh, this methanol and ammonia involve supported metal oxide uh, catalysts and uh, in if you look at this so methanol in terms of you know the ma uh, say magnitude of these industries you can uh, get an idea about this that methanol alone consumes around 0.4% of the total energy spent in the world and ammonia is about 1% of the total energy. So these are major molecules, one of the most produced molecules. So catalysis, uh, catalysts can be classified on the basis of different parameters. One first and foremost being the physical state whether it's in uh, gas form, liquid form or uh, solid form, substance from which the catalyst is prepared. When, when I say which the catalyst is prepared is the base material. So inorganic acids, metals, metal oxides, it, then there are organic enzymes, biocatalysts, then phase of catalyst and reaction. So whether the reactants and catalysts are in the same phase or they are different phase, so you have homogeneous and heterogeneous. And nowadays you also have uh, heterogenized homogeneous catalysts. So uh, action of catalyst, acid base, enzymatic, photocatalytic or electrocatalytic where you know the earlier ones uh, they may require on some thermal energy in photocatalysis it may require it may also require additional photons to activate a particular system. And electrocatalyst means electric potential difference would be required along with the catalyst to initiate a uh, possible conversion or reaction. So types of catalysts are so in homogeneous catalysts you have uh, uh, various acids. You also have uh, metal uh, complexes like uh, nickel, palladium, cobalt, uh, cobalt acetate or something like that. So these are all in solution. So you can uh, add it to a liquid phase and they act as a homogeneous catalyst. Uh, where catalyst is in a different phase so that we already, so this is metal oxides, zeolites, some clays, supported metals, then uh, nanoparticle based where the surface energy uh, because of nanonization the surface energy changes so therefore they become active as uh, catalysts then last one is something which is emerging now thin film uh, 3d structures these are essentially at an experimental stage right now uh, this could be something like graphene which is doped with metal or active uh, sites and uh, these are uh, graphene based these are being considered as a solution for many of the problems which the catalysts face today but they are still in the developmental stage and work is being carried out on this on theoretical studies as well as uh, practical studies so these are some of the um, metal free then enzymes you have proteins cattle broadly classified as catalase, amylase, invertase, am amidases. So these are uh, enzymes. So typically in a, this is uh, what we are showing here is a heterogeneous catalyst. Typically in this you have a gas phase, then you have, uh, uh, then you have a liquid phase here, which is a stagnant layer, a thin film stagnant layer and then you have this porous solid which has active catalytic sites. So on this uh, solid you may have doped certain uh, metal oxides or platinum or anything which is a catalytic site. So you have in a catalytic process now you have a gas phase say uh, typically if I exemplify this with hydrogenation you have hydrogen gas which will first dissolve at the interface into the liquid phase which is typically a solvent and then it will uh, uh, after dissolution it will trans uh, it will uh, travel within the liquid phase and come to the uh, uh, solid liquid boundary here 
and then diffuse through the porous solids to the active site which is here and this site gets bonded with the hydrogen and then the so it's arrived at the reaction site through the pores and absorb on the site and it gets activated and then the reaction happens so there would be another liquid so this would also be filled with the organic layer here so the substrate on which it is to act they react and then after the reaction has happened then the other challenge is for this to come back so it has to follow in the reverse uh, up to the uh, return to the gas phase or to the relevant phase say for example uh, if hydrogen is consumed then it will uh, not return it will uh, what the hydrogen or the reduced protonated product would go back to the liquid stage and become the product so uh, so this is typically so it can give you a picture of the complexity of uh, making things work using a catalyst, particularly a heterogeneous catalyst. So as uh, we have seen here, the catalyst uh, is you have an active phase where uh, chemisorption and catalysis actually happens. So these are the active sites that we had shown in the earlier model. Then support, dispersion and thermal uh, mechanical strength, stability. So these are inorganic oxides, carbons, polymers, uh, so promoters, these uh, because catalysis as all of you know is a surface chemistry based uh, effect. So if you alter the surface chemistry by uh, using some uh, promoters, it can alter. So you can dope the catalyst or you can, uh, so these are some of the promoters. Then stabilizers typically would uh, mean that they prevent something like sintering of the because this is a, a microporous structure. So at high temperature or high pressures, they may just collapse or they may just fuse together. So to prevent that, attenuators, uh, uh, unfortunately, at a catalytic site, there could be many reactions which are possible. Some of them are desirable. Some of them are not desirable. So you may want to attenuate some of them. So for that, you may deliberately want to so-called poison the catalyst or use some moderators, which will prevent those side reactions from happening and give you only the reaction that we want predominantly. Then uh, moderators, this uh, are uh, again, chemisorption modulation and uh, also, uh, particularly at high temperatures, uh, if there are many processes which operate at very high temperatures and very uh, high pressures using organic materials as feedstock or products. So in that case, there is a splitting and then you can have coke formation. So to sometimes to prevent that. There's also an interesting debate going on in terms of moderators since we have put moderators here. So whether these are part of catalyst or that itself is a catalyst, something like uh, if you look at nuclear power plants or nuclear reactors, heavy water is used as a moderator. So it slows down the uh, neutrons so that it can again have the right energy to uh, continue the chain reaction. Otherwise, if it is not there, then it may just uh, be uncontrollable and you have bang. So, uh, so to contain the energy of the neutrons to uh, have a sustainable uh, chain reaction, some, uh, this is used. So, uh, because it is altering the mechanism of the reaction or the rate of the reaction, sometimes that also is, some people call it catalyst, that's a debatable point, but some people prefer to call that also as a catalyst. So, as we discussed just now, catalyst typically has an active phase, there is a promoter, may or may not be there, but at least uh, active phase and support are always there. So, some of the uh, common catalyst supports are alumina, silica, zeolite 
activated carbon. The main thing here is you want to increase the surface area per unit of mass. So if uh, your surface area is very high, the reaction sites available per unit of mass or the per uh, say gram of catalyst becomes very high. And typically if the, uh, the catalyst per se is uh, say something like precious metal, then you would want to use the minimum quantity of metal to uh, sort of uh, get your product going. So some of the, these are some of the very commonly used substrates. So main criteria for selection of catalysts for uh, uh, is what kind of selectivity if there are multiple reactions which are possible. So is it helping you to selectively target the product that you want? how is the activity how fast does it work does how substantially does it reduce cycle time or the pressure conditions or the temperature conditions then the stability of the catalyst itself because do i need to change it after every reaction or can i run it continuously for years altogether without having to change anything so one typical uh, uh, example here you, if you see the effect of the catalyst per se. So you have syngas which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen mixture. So with the copper uh, as the primary catalyst or cop you get uh, formaldehyde. If nickel is used then you get methane and uh, water and for uh, metal oxides zinc or copper or chromium we get methanol. So from the same product there are many different things which are possible depending on the catalyst, the temperature and pressure conditions. So typically these would be at lower uh, temperatures, uh, upper ones at lower temperature and pressure. So this is the at very high temperature and pressure you may directly get methanol. As you can see probably the amount of energy required to convert to a higher form of molecule is it keeps on going on increasing. So you require more temperature, higher pressure here. Another uh, transformation is the oxidation of ethane. So uh, if you have, uh, if your react, uh, reactants are same, so you have oxygen and you have uh, ethane. So if we can make that oxygen as a nucleophilic oxygen, then we get an alkene uh, ethene here. And if uh, Say if I just burn it, what will I get? I will get carbon, di carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and water. So I may get some energy here, but I will not get the desired product. So this is So this is uh, again uh, how the catalyst typically are developed. So you had uh, uh, say nickel and Syria based uh, catalyst where activity is okay, selectivity is low. Then you have uh, 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 nickel and zirconium. So uh, you have activity which is low, selectivity is very high. So then you make a composite of these. So where your activity is very high and selectivity is also good. So your ultimate say transformation from uh, the reactant to the product would be a combination of selectivity as well as activity. So this uh, is how you know people keep on trying different combinations and uh, products together and work out what would suit the, uh, that particular transformation the best. This is typically the screening cycle for like for any uh, chemical development. This is a typical uh, cycle which is also used in uh, screening. Only thing is in uh, catalyst screening since there are so many materials, there's a lot of published data. So basis that you make an initial selection, then uh, uh, once uh, that seems promising, then you go on characterization find, and defining the mechanism. 
working out the kinetics of the reaction with the catalyst, then do the st primary stability testing of the catalyst. If it still is uh, and at piloting stage you do this and then uh, you scale up pilot testing, then you make a proper uh, commercial uh, reactor design and then finally the plant testing. The as you can see, the effort and time, which in turn translates to time and money, goes on increasing. So, sometimes you have many cycles here. So, that is why the development of catalysts is a fairly expensive proposition. So, these are some of the methods of uh, preparation. Very briefly, uh, you have uh, a solution and a, a moderator with pH, say for pH base. So, you put the support material on which you want to deposit the catalyst and adjust the pH and put it there. So, you have precipitation onto the pores of the catalyst and then uh, uh, you filter it out separate and then dry. Other could be impregnation which is also typically for uh, uh, metal, precious metal. So, you may have a chloroplatinic acid uh, solution here and you uh, put the catalyst support there. It gets impregnated with that. You just put almost equivalent to the pore volume of the uh, catalyst and uh, those pores get filled after some amount of saturation. Then you take it out and uh, dry these and calcine these. Then these are some of the ion exchange uh, resins which are also used as catalysts. So you have these, uh, uh, you may have anionic or cationic uh, catalyst. Or you may have an ion exchange where uh, uh, something like uh, the bottom. So, dry mixing is uh, essentially where it is not so, the substrate is not soaked into the uh, uh, say uh, solution, but that solution is kind of sprayed onto the uh, catalyst, and then after uh, spray coating it, then it is dried. So that's uh, dry. So, this is calcination, high temperature, you subject it to high temperature. Then typically if you have uh, uh, say noble metal, so you may want to activate the side. So, uh, the, uh, so this is reduced in presence of say hydrogen and then uh, uh, the metal becomes in, comes into the active phase. And if, uh, if you have, for example, if you are using molybdenum sulphide as a catalyst, then you would do the sulfidation process. So, this is again batch uh, reaction and then uh, you have continuous. So, in uh, continuous as you can see uh, one primary differentiator is that typically you would want to use uh, uh, solid catalyst or uh, heterogeneous catalyst so that you can, uh, uh, you can easily separate uh, this. You do not have to first take because then uh, if it is a homogeneous one then you have to separate it distill out or do whatever and then recycle that. Here uh, it is uh, typically say if it is a fixed bed you do not have to really do any separation at all. So, uh, in uh, continuous ones you have uh, say fixed bed or fluidized bed. Typically uh, fluidized bed uh, uh, would offer better heat and mass transfer and also one very important thing is if we have to if the catalyst is getting poisoned for some reason, you still want to maintain it in a continuous phase, then you keep adding in a fluidized state. It is possible to remove and recycle that catalyst and keep adding fresh catalyst. So, that becomes uh, really easy when you are doing a fluidized bed. So, now some of the um, industrially important, these have been going on for donkey's years. So, uh, but the idea is that how they have evolved over the years. So, uh, steam reforming, so this is responsible for 95 percent annual production of hydrogen. This is produced. The other say processes like electrolysis and all that is also there, but this is 95 percent and hydrogen as you know is the largest on a molar basis in terms of moles of hydrogen produced. This is the largest uh, production chemical in the world. So, hydrogen typically you do not want to be storing it because 
of obvious reasons this is the only two uh, is the molecular weight so you don't want to be storing it as a gas difficult to liquefy so uh, normally it would be used immediately so this is the typical uh, process where uh, uh, you are having a feed which may be naphtha which may be uh, gas compressed natural gas or any for that matter many organic uh, uh, feed stocks so the so you have steam reforming through a catalyst where the upper reaction happens you get uh, meth say if it is methane then you get carbon uh, uh, monoxide and this and then the bottom is the shift reaction where where you again uh, this uh, carbon monoxide gets converted to uh, carbon dioxide and produces hydrogen so these two top reactions are happening first one happens in the reforming second is the shift reaction after that you get a, uh, as you can see you will have carbon monoxide there you will have carbon dioxide there you will have hydrogen there and you will have some amount of uh, uh, other uh, products also so and the hydrogen which is required in say urea production or ammonia production um, typically say ammonia if that is required to be produced that that catalysts are iron based catalysts so if you have any of these other things so those say oxygen or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide they will poison that catalyst very very quickly so it is important to have this last step now this i'm uh, putting here pressure swing adsorption but it may also be a combination of pressure swing adsorption and membrane based uh, purification systems so uh, so the idea is to get extremely pure hydrogen and less pure hydrogen is taken as a purge gas that may be utilized by uh, typical reduction hydrogenation where purity of hydrogen where for example noble metal catalysts are used so they will not get affected by carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide to that extent so it can be used there or if it is not there then usually it is burnt as a fuel so current state of affairs it started off with around 50% currently you get up to 80% conversion efficiencies it's dependent on the major the catalyst part has not changed but the plant design has evolved in terms of say one typical example would be how is the catalyst maintained at a uniform temperature so whether you have one burner heating it or multiple burners heating it so that is really affecting the so it is a design evolution rather than the catalyst evolution catalyst whatever was discussed discovered almost a century ago or 50 60 years ago continues to be the same but it is a plant optimization which has yielded a better result then uh, this of course many people are aware of how this process was developed at gun point <laughs> virtually so uh, this is uh, as i indicated in the previous one so you have uh, iron based catalyst which is with a promoter so the reaction is simple but uh, so uh, this is done at a very high temperature and pressure and hydrogen comes from the previous slide that we saw from uh, steam reforming of gas naphtha gas and naphtha are the main uh, at least in india these are the only two sources of uh, or uh, hydrogen and uh, significant as i said significant cost is not only uh, in terms of energy which is required to produce it but also to purify it so this is typically how it looks like so you have pure hydrogen and pure nitrogen which more or less comes from air uh, fractionation so you have this going to a compressor to raise the pressure and then it goes to a high temperature uh, catalyst bed uh, this would be something like uh, 20 meters or so tall and from there uh, the converted ammonia is condensed and uh, taken off and the spent gases are re uh, recirculated of course in, i mean this is a very broad uh, very simplified uh, version of this actually it is far more much much more complex than this so as you can see this process has uh, 
benefited not on the catalyst development to some extent yes to increase the stability and all that but typically as a process optimization this whole process optimization has resulted to getting efficiencies up to 95 percent today so uh, you can see the scale of operations when the first plant of bsf based on this process was built the capacity was 10 tons per day in today we are typically having the uh, plants are between 2000 and 3000 tons per day so almost 200 to 300 fold increase in the productivity and of course the corresponding uh, efficiencies also increase and now there are some reports of uh, plants in Saudi Arabia which are closer to 4000, uh, 5000, uh, uh, 3000 to 4000 uh, tons per day capacity but So, one uh, typical, uh, I don't know whether this leads to this or this leads to this, but the statistics say that uh, the growth of human population has been possible because the ammonia and therefore the conversion to urea, the fertilizers, we have been able to continuously increase our fertilizer uptake and therefore we are able to sustain a much larger population. Now, this is always debatable whether uh, it is a right thing to do or not, but this is the data. Then uh, this FT process. So, so, sorry, this methanol production, 40% uh, of methanol is converted to remaining is used as synthesis of fine chemicals or as a solid fuel additive. As I had said earlier, this is a major industrial chemical and uh, consumes around 0.4% of the total energy being used in the world today. So this is the, uh, as we had seen earlier also in my uh, earlier slide that uh, with Syngas, if you have this uh, uh, ported, uh, so it's all copper oxide, zinc oxides and carrier is also alumina, you get 99.5% uh, efficiencies. And uh, so energy efficiency, etc. And you uh, to prevent any uh, uh, coke formation, etc. Some steam, etc. Is used. So the point is that this is almost at the edge of what can be done with this catalyst as of now. So 99.5 percent, as you would agree, is a fairly large efficiency. But the problem is the energy consumption. 0.4% of total world's energy is consumed in producing one product. So now therefore we require catalysts which are able to operate at lower temperatures and pressures. So therefore with the current one we have already reached a saturation limit. So now the search is on for a catalyst which will be able to do this. So. Uh, this Fischer and Trop reaction, uh, Syngas, uh, this is uh, as you are aware that there are many companies who are doing this now. So you have carbon uh, Syngas to produce feedstock for the uh, uh, refineries or uh, existing plants which are already able, which are already doing fractionation for this or uh, not doing it. Now, uh, there is uh, uh, syngas with uh, iron or cobalt catalyst. The temperature is 25 bar and uh, you have either 230, uh, 230 Celsius, uh, uh, which is low temperature fissure drop, 
or high temperature which operates at 320. The difference between these is the high temperature if you see the mass fraction versus carbon number. So it gives you bulk of the product in the lower carbon numbers whereas the low temperature one will give you a very wide range of uh, carbon numbers and uh, fortunately it mimics this is the this red line here is the Arabian light crude. So it mimics Arabian light crude. So from something like carbon monoxide and hydrogen you are able to produce uh, material which is something like a crude. This is hot process for uh, uh, production of uh, phenol. So 1943-44 lab scale and 2022, uh, 2020 we are producing. So you can see from 43 to 53 is really the commercialization interval. So almost 10 years it took for this catalyst to be commercialized. And today essentially the same process is followed and we are producing something like 14.32 million tons of uh, phenol worldwide. Ninety percent of global phenol production is through cumin hydroperoxide route. So we'll. So you have the starting material is benzene. You uh, do a uh, formation of uh, cumin. Then you uh, have a cumin hydroperoxide. Then this gets transformed into phenol, and then uh, uh, equimolar. So uh, there's a cleavage of cumin hydroperoxide into phenol and uh, uh, acetone. So this is just uh, the development of uh, the process. So you can see the time and effort it takes to develop. The idea of showing this is the time and effort it takes to develop a process from a concept to uh, commercial production and then optimization at a commercial scale. So today uh, uh, at Deepak we are following the same process uh, but we are going ahead with this QZ201. Uh, uh, it's also a zeolite beta catalyst but modified one to get a better. So this is the development. So for cumin production, we are still using the same old UOP process, but uh, for uh, cumin to uh, then finally uh, phenol UOP process. So these are again some of the products that I will just skip through. I think we are uh, running out of time. so. So ibuprofen, um, so you can see there's an old boot process which involves a uh, lot of steps and then there is the hex process. So acylation, then reduction and carbonylation to form ibuprofen in three steps. Now uh, I think the major trend for uh, catalysis globally today is that uh, I mean whatever we had to do in the chemical uh, field has been probably optimized to a very large extent but what next? So this is uh, what I would call a dream machine because as we have seen most of these catalytic processes operate at high temperatures and high pressure. So high temperature and high pressure comes by burning something by generating thermal energy. Thermal energy means somewhere or the other you are producing carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide causes what greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect increases the temperature and sustainability of the planet. So there's a big debate going on that. So what to do then about this? So one of the 
I mean, some of the pioneering work which is happening and basis which uh, recently a few years ago Nobel Prize was also awarded in field of catalysis is trying to use now we have we are already at a point of inflection where the cost of power generated via solar photovoltaic or even wind power has reached a level where it is below the cost of electricity produced by say natural uh, resources, natural gas or something like that. So one thing is there that we have electrical power available for which I do not require a thermal degradation or thermal burning or producing carbon dioxide. There's also nuclear power, but that is a different story because that has its own sustainability issues. So now the main the main challenge here would be to have to develop a catalyst where nitrogen, carbon dioxide and water you have uh, H2O and O2 so you have water, you have nitrogen in atmosphere you, you capture carbon dioxide which we are otherwise emitting into atmosphere or we capture at source and then <coughs> have a catalytic conversion at one end you are you are electrocatalytically converting uh, breaking water into hydrogen that hydrogen then uh, uh, goes to this cycle whereby you produce the feed stock for fuels for uh, whatever refineries that we have already, there are huge refinery complexes which have already been set up. So to produce feedstock for those, also to produce hydrogen which can be used say for uh, fuel cells or uh, for green hydrogen and uh, ammonia which becomes a feedstock for urea etc etc. So this and using this electricity coming from the clean uh, energy sources like wind or uh, photovoltaic. So uh, you can see that catalyst, this is over a period of uh, almost uh, uh, more than a century, there have been only very few uh, Nobel uh, laureates who have got uh, Nobel prizes because of their work on catalysis. There are one or two missing here, I think around 2003 or so there was another one. So. So work on this is uh, not really uh, picked up, but currently lot of, in a lot of universities uh, actively funded by Department of Energy, uh, US. And so there are a lot of uh, work going on in the field of catalysis towards that dream machine that I had already presented. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. You mentioned about uh, by benzene, cumin, then the um, phenol aston process. Yeah. In, in Kochi, in Hindu sun refineries, they are making that. So, until it is in practice until the crude oil uh, is available, after say about four or five decades. Afterwards, if crude oil depletes, where from this benzene will come to produce phenol? Not only the, 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 there is no problem of aston because by, uh, by interesting biotechnology process, uh, Clostridium astrobutalicum culture, okay, butanol and astone that was produced in uh, Second World War by Germans, that uh, technology well established. When coral depletes in the world, definitely this interesting biotechnology process by this uh, Clostridium astrobutalicum to produce uh, astone and uh, butanol that will come into practice in the world. No question of astone, but the, there will be the question of uh, phenol. So, I am. Uh, so, what is it? The what is the question actually? I'm sorry, I did not get the. What is what is it? Oh yeah, okay, okay, fine. So that I understand. I agree with you. So, as I said, uh, that dream machine, so-called dream machine, is a step towards that. So that you produce feed stock, which will sustain the industries, which are based on, say, typically uh, petroleum, crude, or some other uh, uh, resources coal uh, based resources which will vanish after some time so that that is why that's called a dream machine so that's it